Jack Peterson here. Are you ready for another exciting episode of Gimme Five? I hope so. Somebody stopped me the other day. They said, Jack, why do you call it Gimme Five? It's a half an hour show. You're right. It did start out as a show of five minute little segments of interesting topics. Kind of morphed into a 30 minute show. Don't really want to call it Gimme 30. So we're going to stick with the title. Later on this program, we're going to check in with Ricky Schmidt. He operates a company called Heli Perspective. It's drones. He's our drone guy. He builds them. He flies them for photographic purposes. He'll stop by and dispel the myths and rumors about the industry and give us a demonstration. Right now, though, let's get things going with a couple drones of a different sort, radio DJs, something I happen to know a little bit about. Let's head on over to Mapleton Communications and, and check out a couple of my radioactive friends. Classic Rock 104.3, The Hippo, great song from Pearl Jam. Now, maybe you got a chance to see those guys when they rocked out at the Shoreline just a couple of weeks ago for the Bridge School Benefit concert. Great job, great job. In the rock and roll news, charges for this guy just dropped. Not going to jail after all. Not enough to charge him with the uh, attempted murder charge. Phil Rudd and ACDC, 104.3, The Hippo. Well, my name's Kenny Allen. I'm the operations manager and the program director here at 104.3, The Hippo. I've been in the radio business about 20 years now, and I got into it because I love music, and I just couldn't imagine uh, going through life not working in the music business. I can't play any, so I play the hits. It's pretty fun. Uh, play a lot of great rock and roll here. We've actually moved into the 90s and a little bit of the 2000s stuff. Some of the artists that we play with regular rotation here, and it's a lot of fun. We really like to rock it out here on the Central Coast, and we think the audience likes it too. Uh, it's something I always had a passion for ever since I was a kid, and then as I got older and was not doing it, I felt like the, the time would be now. Started interning at a radio station, kind of saw how it all worked. Really got turned on by the whole thing, and eventually got a part-time shift, led to full-time, and I've been doing it now for almost 20 years. In those 20 years, I've primarily been here in this market. I started working at a country station over in Salinas. They closed, they changed formats there, got blown out, worked at Kadon for a while, and then kind of got out of it other than just dabbling part-time for about a year or so, and then came back full-time to a station called BTU that played you know old school and rhythmic type music. And then I've uh, been full-time doing that ever since, and in this particular building for almost 15 years, which is a rarity in this business. If you really want to get into the business, you need to have a, a very well-rounded education and have some other things to fall back on. The business has changed a lot. Uh, it's, it's computerized. You really need some serious production skills on a computer, like an Adobe Audition, uh, Cool Edit, something like that. Pro Tools is huge. Uh, you really need to know a lot about behind the scenes stuff. Audio is one, you know how to put something together, assemble audio. Uh, a, lot, a lot happens out in the field in terms of promotions, but you want a well-rounded education, so you need something to fall back on because it's, it, the business has changed and it's not, uh, it's not the big money-making business it used to be 20 years ago. Reading and writing is critical in a business like this. You're reading a lot of copy. We've got notes in here constantly that we're, uh, we're updating and telling people about. You've got to be able to put your thoughts into words. Uh, you've got to be able to look at a lot of copy and, and translate that into something more concise and informative. Reading and writing is critical if you're going to get in this game, absolutely critical. One of the fun things we did a few years ago, about four years ago when we had a country station, uh, there was a big battle for Sheriff, uh, Kanalakis, uh, Scott Miller, uh, Fred Garcia, and we had them all into the KCAT studio and we had the Sheriff Showdown. It was a fantastic debate before the election, and those guys really, really tore each other apart. But it was fun to be a part of that. A lot of other people tried to coordinate that, that type of a, an event, and they just weren't having it. These guys all liked the station. They came down, and we had the Sheriff Showdown. That was really, really a cool thing about four years ago. The biggest prize we ever gave away was a $10,000 birthday payout about 15 years ago, I was working with BTU at the time and, and Sybil, Sybil D'Angelo, the morning girl with me, and we had a $10,000 birthday giveaway that was pretty cool. That was the biggest one so far. Next is a car. Now, if you've not heard of the Hippo and you really want to check out some great rock and roll, 104.3 FM on your dial. You can also get us on the web at thehippo.com. We stream there. You can also download our app and listen to, uh, listen to the station on your phone anywhere you are. It's a great station. If you like rock and roll, this is the one to be listening to. Hi, everybody. I'm John Michael, working here at 104.3 The Hippo. I am a midday on-air radio jock. 
Air personality. I don't think we're disc junkies anymore, but I'm not sure. Uh, I also have recently learned how to do traffic. Good traffic is not the stuff where you're in the car going like, dog on it, I can't get to where I want to go. Traffic is, is the insertion of commercials, which is what makes radio free for you. There's a lot of facets of doing radio and to any more really keep a job in radio, you cannot just be an on-air personality. You've got to learn a lot of different things. Of course, I love being on air, but uh, I don't mind doing the other things, uh, which involves radio. So I, I can honestly tell you that I cannot not see myself doing radio. It would be odd. I've been out of a radio job for a while, and it was the loneliest uh, year that I had trying to figure out, what am I going to do? I can't do radio. I need to do radio. And uh, so I got back in. So how did I find radio? As a child, I, <laughs> I was reminiscing with a friend of mine the other day. And uh, I, as a kid, at that time, had vinyl records. I mean, if you're not quite sure what that is, ask your folks. And I used to have a cassette deck. And again, ask your folks, what's a cassette? And I would play records on the record player and record it and say things in between, introducing the song and stuff like that without realizing at that time that I wanted to do radio. Now, the, the point where I actually fell into wanting to do radio was when I was uh, playing in a band and uh, it was falling apart at that time. And I was also, from my day job, I was a machinist. And I heard this commercial come on the radio. If I wanted to be a radio disc jockey, come to the Columbia School of Broadcasting. So I did. $3,000 later, and, uh, and I think it took me about almost eight months to a year. The school was more of a, a kick in the pants to go out and look for a job, because they would ask uh, all the places that I, I went to apply for jobs, well, how, where'd you get your training? Columbia School of Broadcasting, oh, oh. Then I had to intern. I finally found one, one place that actually took me in. And so my first radio gig where I actually got on air was uh, 102.5 Kadon in Salinas. And uh, this was back in the 80s. So uh, from the 80s until now, I've been doing radio. Uh, I've been with uh, KHIP for about 17 years, depending when you listen to this or watch this video. And uh, I loved it ever since. So the running joke is, how do you get a radio voice? That's a lot of whiskey and cigarettes. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. Not only do I do this radio gig, but I've got a, a TV show called John Michael's Rock Box on Comcast 26. Let me do one suggestion for you about getting into any of these things. Confidence. Gotta have confidence, and then eventually, you'll learn the KISS method. You keep it simple, stupid, because really, it's like drumming, less is more. I'm also a drummer in a band. I play in several. And one of them's Rod, one's JJ Hogg, and uh, another one's Bent. Uh, good to go. I bounce around. Whoever wants to pay me the most, no, I'm just kidding. Whoever, whoever I book with at the moment is the one I'll be playing with on the weekend. So there's the, there's the band gig, there's a the radio gig, there's a the TV show, uh, and now actually I'm gonna start doing voiceovers, which uh, when you start doing radio, voice acting of some sort is a great way uh, to uh, actually make some income and continue on with the radio gig. So, continue success. Hopefully you find what you want and fall in love with it, but be careful because radio is very addicting. Today's K-Wave 96.9. Moves like Jagger, that's music from Maroon 5. Already 7.45, 15 minutes away from 8 o'clock. Looks like rain is headed our way Saturday. We're gonna go ahead and check your traffic and weather seconds away. All right, Jack Peterson here. You just found that out. A uh, big thank you to Kenny Allen and John Michael for their segments today on radio. A lot of experience between those two guys. Me, myself, 30 years experience this year. Isn't that amazing? Let's shift gears. Let's head on over to Monterey. We're gonna find out about drones and Ricky Schmidt, the builder and operator of Heli Perspective. Hi, my name is Ricky Schmidt and I own a local aerial drone company based out of Monterey, California called Heli Perspective. Okay, so the way I got started in the aerial drone business is through RC hobbyist uh, aircraft flying. About 15 years ago, when I was um, 
working out at Laguna Seca Raceway. I was a, uh, doing instructing out there for race car driving and stuff. There would be a lot of downtime that we would have and I would design and uh, fly RC helicopters. And this went on for some time, three, four years, five years, six years, and then um, I was doing some work with a production company through uh, the racing school itself and I saw that one of the uh, production team members had an aerial rig and it was amazing, I couldn't believe it. I, I probably had three or four helicopters in the garage at the time that were suitable for lifting a camera. So I put two and two together and decided to see if I could start my own business and make it happen. And um, I've been doing it for about a year and a half now. I'm having a whole bunch of fun and I'm, I'm helping a lot of people get incredible shots where otherwise it would be impossible to try to get a shot with a uh, with a conventional style collective pitch helicopter. Um, also, there's real people inside of these collective pitch helicopters that makes it very dangerous to do almost anything that's low to the ground or below 400 feet. We don't, we don't ever go above 400 feet with our rig. So that's how I got started. Now when you say helicopter, we're gonna talk about a collective pitch helicopter where if there's a single, single rotor wing above the main shaft and with a tail rudder. And the comparison that we're making is that between the helicopter and what they call a multi-rotor platform. Uh, a multi-rotor has um, multiple engines in a circular formation, or motors in a circular formation, that um, allow the payload to be lifted. And it doesn't vibrate nearly as much because there is way less mechanical moving parts on board. The helicopter has the tail rudder, uh, which is under incredible stress 100% of the time it's being operated. And anything that goes wrong with that tail rudder, it could be a, a two cent part, and that whole rig's going down. The multi-rotor platform has backup redundancy on the, on the motor power, which means if it loses one or two motors, it will fly home on its own and land autonomously without the pilot having to do anything. The multi-rotor also has features like the uh, transmitter. If the transmitter uh, has lost communication between it and the ground operator, the multi-rotor will come home and land autonomously all by itself. So the biggest difference between the two is safety, reliability, and the mechanical performance for um, aerial videography is a lot more uh, consistent and easier to obtain with the multi-rotor platform because it was literally designed to lift a camera. The helicopter was never designed to lift anything except for people and then it was modified from there. You know, the RC platform world from the RC helicopters started out with performance. So there's a lot of people that take remote control helicopters. The whole uh, reason why RC helicopters were designed initially is for uh, competition, performance, aerobatic capabilities. So these high performance helicopters basically are only typically used in the perfor performance arenas. They were, they were never designed to, to do anything else besides fly upside down at incredible rates of speed. They do barrel rolls like airplanes. So those helicopters come from that arena and then they get highly modified to lift cameras. So you're kind of reverse engineering something and then re-engineering it again to try to get it to lift the camera. A lot of work goes into modifying a collective pitch helicopter to lift um, a camera versus a multi-rotor where it's, it's uh, if you can get the multi-rotor put together and understand how, to f how it flies, um, you can very easily put whatever gimbal you want to on the bottom of it and it's, it's very, very uh, versatile and it's very user friendly. The helicopter, if it has any kind of a problem up there, uh, it's not gonna come home on its own. Uh, it only has one motor on board. So the helicopter will be used for, now you asked the biggest difference between the two. In the field, the biggest difference is speed. You can go about 90 miles an hour with a remote control helicopter with a fairly decent camera on board. With about a five pound count camera on board, it'll do about 90 miles an hour. The multi-rotors will not go that fast and still what they call hold the frame. So the multi-rotor holds the frame from about zero miles an hour to 15 miles an hour, great. Uh, and that's great for production companies because they love static, you know, walk along shots where you might be following somebody in a field. But the production company no longer has to set up 500 feet of rails on the ground and try to figure out how to make that work smoothly or hire a camera boom company to come out at incredible amounts of money per hour. When you can just now take the multi-rotor with one single operator 
and do the entire shoot at low speeds with no problem. Uh, once you get up above about 30 miles an hour, you might want to go to your helicopter platform at that point, um, which uh, you can easily make that switch if you have both rigs equipped. Um, and then the, cam the cameras as well. You're building both platforms around the cameras, so you're really talking about how much weight you're trying to move. The, uh, most people will tell you the first thing that comes to mind between the two platforms, uh, the differential, is the payload capability. Helicopters can lift a lot more weight than multirotors. Now, that being said, at this time, the multirotors are developing to, uh, bigger airframes to lift almost the same exact payload as some of the equally cost uh, RC helicopters. So technology's um, going through leaps and bounds right now with the multirotor platform for sure. I call probably once a week to talk to a voicemail at the FAA and express my interest in, in getting a license to fly on a regular basis in unrestricted FAA airspace that would be acceptable for aerial videography rigs. I don't actually own a drone, and this is the big issue. A drone has a classification. A drone is a real, is a real operating unit, and it's typically operated by the military. There's three different class drones, class one, class two, class three drones that the military has in, in their arsenal and they are giant uh, FAA regulated, FCC equipment regulated drones that no civilian is ever going to get their hands on, ever. Uh, so what the civilian population has done is they've modified RC airplanes to become uh, aerial photography rigs and then people assume that they're drones because it's a robot that's flying through the sky that's going to spy on all of their things they're doing every day. Like, would it really matter what you're doing every day if it was legal? That's an interesting point to, that's a, for a separate subject. You know, some of my rules, I never go above 400 feet and my other rule is I ne I'm never out further than 2,500 foot radial from my original launch point. Even if I have to move 16 times to get the shot, if it's a chase shot or something, I'll move 16 times or I'll just jump in a chase car chasing the object on the ground if we have to do, do it that way. So I, I have found that my rule, I don't fly close to airports or any kind of um, marine base sanctuaries or anything like this where it's going to uh, throw up red flags. I don't fly over any people directly ever. That's another thing that I do that keeps me um, hidden. Um, hidden no longer though because of this interview I'm sure but you know things are changing and I'm, I am taking a little bit of a risk by doing it, this interview but yeah you know you just stick to the plan of common sense and there's one thing in life that I don't think you can teach people and that is common sense and there are my competitors there's some of my competitors out there that are making me look bad because they break these rules you know they're up there around a thousand feet because they don't want to you know drive and uh, drive and park six times to get the shot of the golf course they just want to park once and go up to a thousand feet get one shot and leave and their job's done in 10 minutes where me it's going to take me 45 minutes and with some creative editing involved but it's all for safety um, what the FAA needs to do is hurry it up because we need to know where those other aviators are we have to know we need to be able to call the tower from the ground and say we're going we're going up in the air we're going to be up in the air for 25 minutes is the airspace clear and they will clear a sphere a bubble for us hopefully if it's acceptable if it's not we wait or move right it's all should be or this all should be orchestrated by the uh, FAA to make it as as uh, reasonable and realistic on people as possible because the bottom line is you're not going to stop people from doing this you can buy anybody with eight hundred dollars can buy a drone and put it at two thousand feet within fifteen minutes of buying it and opening it and they can watch a live view off their cell phone of what that drone sees you know so and, and it seems like every neighbor that i talk to about my business has a drone and they know exactly about they know they know all about these drones and you know from from the uh, just from the standpoint that they're calling them drones is they don't really know what they're talking about so we need a system so what I do is when people ask me what it is I tell folks it's a it's a hexagonal multi-rotor platform that's an aerial photography rig that I custom built and there's only one of these type in the world now when I say in the world the kits start out as a stamped out kit from uh, from your favorite manufacturer and that's basically everybody has that same basic kit for about 800 bucks to up to two thousand dollars and then the rest of it's basically custom made the way it sits now with the ground equipment that I have just this one here not that helicopter with just this camera here one camera is about eighty seven hundred bucks if you're listening out there 
I have no interest in spying on your personal life. <laughs> I get nothing from that whatsoever. I've got so much money tied up into this, I've crashed. I've crashed over $20,000 worth of RC helicopters. It's one of those deals where uh, I'm doing everything I can when I go out to work to try to make a buck just like you guys are, and I'm using my head doing it. I'm fully insured as well, up to $500,000 for personal liability and personal property damage. And, I, and then that insurance works for the whole entire world, and it's applicable to anything on the ground. But I'm not insured through my own airframe because these airframes ye are not insurable as of yet because there's no classification on them. There's no CF, there's no number on it, there's no registration number and stuff like this. So when I, every time I go up, I'm putting over $10,000 in the air. I hope to get that aerial photography rig back once it goes up. And so I'm doing everything I can to get up, get the job done, and, and get home. And I don't fly over anybody's house that I'm not supposed to. When I go, when I go do my real estate uh, shots, it's literally we're in and out in 30 minutes. I go up to about 300 feet and I do a radial blast of about 45 high resolution pictures with the Sony A7. And we don't even wake up dogs. So we've never had one complaint either. And I think mainly it's because we're not trying to use it irresponsibly. So Heli Perspective is a responsible aerial videography company that will not do you any harm. And say hello if you see us. We'll give you a business card if you're interested. A big thanks to our guests today, Ricky Schmidt and my radio friends, Kenny Allen and John Michael. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Gimme Five. <laughs>